I used to dread going to parties. I stood around, struggling with small talk, waiting for an opening to dive into big ideas. That changed in 2000, when I was a freshman in college, and I read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point. So what is a book? A book is 75,000 words. In a good day, you should be able to write 1,000 words a day. So you should be able to do a draft of a book if you know what you're writing about in yeah. 75 days. Now, that's absurd, of course. No one does a book in 75 days. Malcolm made it cool to talk about social science. And that started me down the path of becoming a psychologist and an author. Malcolm and I have become friends. But here's the thing. We don't always see eye to eye, which is part of the fun of getting on stage about once a year to debate. I think comedians are master psychologists. Oh, I Agree or you disagree? Know, totally disagree. Uh, <laughs> I'm Adam Grant, and this is Work Life, my podcast with Ted. For this bonus episode, Malcolm and I sat down at the 92nd Street Y. I have to say, you're, you're my favorite sparring partner in the sense that you really take joy in intellectual disagreement. I've discovered that I do too. And so my hope is that we will disagree on some things tonight. Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when we do, uh, I hope you take that as a sign that I respect your opinion enough to want to change it. All right. <laughs> And ideally, I will win more of these arguments than I lose. Yes. Is that, I, is that fair on ground rules? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm happy to lose arguments to you anytime you want. Great. Yeah. You should do this more often. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you're here. So the place I wanted to start is to say that you know, when, when I think about work life, we both spend a huge, a huge part of our work lives thinking about human behavior and trying to understand it and make sense of it and maybe even make it a little bit better. And I think, you know, we, we're both in jobs that have a pretty strong monopoly on that, right, between journalism and social science. I'm curious, outside of our jobs, what you would say is the occupation that has the most insight into human nature and human behavior? Well, I mean, there are obvious ones. Teachers uh, would be the first. And by extension, and then all of the professions attached to that. So. I, my brother is a principal. I always feel like in the position he's in, he has, he's a principal of an elementary school, so he interacts with kids, their parents, and then the teachers who have to deal with the kids and the parents. Um, and it strikes me that you have a very powerful lens on human beings when you're, particularly because parents are never more crazy than when they are interacting with the teachers of their children. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're, you're gonna nominate principals, teachers, my instinct was comedians. I think as a comedian, you have to understand not only what will make people laugh, but also what's on, right on the edge of making people uncomfortable. And that requires a lot of insight into the immediate reactions that your audience is going to have. And so I, I think comedians are master psychologists. Oh, I Agree or you disagree? Know, totally disagree. Uh, <laughs> because... Who invited you? Think, think about this, no. No, think about this, Adam. So I have my... I'm using the principal teacher as, the, as my model. You're using the, the comedian. The thing that's difficult about the teacher is that the teacher is dealing with people in a natural environment in real time. And there is an infinite variety in the circumstances and the kinds of people that they have to interact with. The comedian, by contrast, is dealing with people in a tightly controlled setting with a rich set of expectations governing their behavior where they get to turn down the lights dose everyone with alcohol, you know, and create an expectation that laughter is the appropriate response to what they're doing. I cannot imagine a better set of circumstances, an easier set of circumstances for navigating uh, a social situation than those. So right? if that's true, when are you ready for your first stand-up performance? I, I would, if you're asking me, that's not the right answer, the best question is, if you're asking me, would I rather teach a class of first graders or do a stand-up performance? And the answer is, I would do a stand-up performance a million times before I would teach a class of first graders. I Infinitely will be, harder. I, I, I cannot wait to present you with both options and, and see what you really choose. But I mean, how could you, it's not even close, by the way. Stand-up, <laughs> one of the things that stand-up comedians do that drives me crazy is that they like to pretend that their profession is this terrifying, death-defying, you know, high-wire act. Have you ever given a performance before a group of people who have been drinking? They are putty in your hands. It's like they're just they're sitting there, they're dosed up with alcohol, waiting to be entertained. That is about as far as you can get from a room full of first graders as is humanly imaginable. <laughs> I think there's some truth to that. I also think, though, that 
the nice thing about, about kids is that the situations repeat over and over again. So you only have a certain number of ways that kids can misbehave and that can, parents can be difficult. And you get to practice over and over again the responses that you want to have. And over time, that becomes a skill, and it becomes expertise. Wait, you don't think comedians practice over and over again? Of course they do. Of course they do. But your audience varies so much. Try to give a, an improv performance in a new country for the first time. Yeah, but they don't do that. They go to Vegas, and they go to the comedy <laughs> cellar, and they go to, I mean, that's They're hanging point. out with the wrong comedians. No, but that's my point. They control their environments. No one controls their environments better than comedians. That's how they manage to do what they do, right? And so you don't think that still requires deep insight into human behavior or not, psychology? Not deep insight. No. Talking to drunk people requires some insight, <laughs> but it's not. You may be doing it right now. <laughs> let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about your work life. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your creative process and where your ideas come from, how you develop them, and any insights for our audience on, on how to be a little bit more creative. Well, you know, I, I did an episode of my podcast last year called The King of Tears, which is all about why it is that country music can do sad songs and rock and roll can't. And one of the things, one of the points I made was something that I've believed very strongly for a long time, which is that country music can be sad when rock and roll can't because country music is specific. And specificity is something I've become increasingly interested in as a trait of interestingness that all the interesting people I know are people whose speech and thinking has a great deal of specificity to it. So I was listening, for example, to an interview with uh, Rostam Bat Moglic, who's the- Is that a person? Yes, it's a, uh, he's a brilliant musician who was one half of uh, Vampire Weekend before they broke up. And I, I happen to know his brother, who's a, also a brilliant um, director. And they have the same quality when they talk about what they do, there is this brilliant level of specificity. So they don't just say, I really loved that film by Alfred Hitchcock, which is what 90% of us would say. What Zoll will say is, if you watch that film by Hitchcock, in the 30-second moment, there's this scene where this happens, and so-and-so says this, and the camera does this, and in that moment, you realize this, right? And Ross did the same thing. He was talking about the song he'd written. And as he went through the song, he, didn't, he identified his, the points of his influence. He zeroed in on exactly the moment in the song from 1969 that he heard when he was a kid in high school in 1989. And, you know, and he was here when he heard it. And that guitar, you know. And you realize that's why you listen to him. And that quality of being specific and being able to illustrate your larger points with that kind of precision is the quality of what makes something interesting. Ever since I've come to understand this, that has informed the way I look for ideas. So I try, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be as precise as possible in how I illustrate an idea. And to understand that in the service of illustrating an idea, you don't have to skate over the, you don't want to skate over the surface. But isn't that what you've always done? Right, like here's a story about a statue. And oh my gosh, that changes your entire understanding of intuition. And here's a, a story about a hockey team or a soccer team. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're going to reimagine how success works and think it's much more luck and opportunity than we yeah, think. Yeah, but I, I think I did it in the beginning without realizing that's what I was doing. So you asked me what my creative process is. And the answer is I've only recently become kind of conscious of it. And I realized, you know, with a podcast, you have to crank up the specificity even more. So you, because now you're listening to somebody's voice, in order to engage someone who's only experiencing this through their ears, you need to like, ramp up the precision. So I, I have a different, I guess, a different take on interestingness, uh, which comes from a, a, a sociologist, Murray Davis, who wrote this, this beautiful paper decades ago called That's Interesting, where he said, ideas survive not because they're true, but because they're interesting. And you're like, huh, that's interesting. This is, this is bad news. Mm -hmm. uh, but then he's kind of proving his point in a meta way. And then he says, well, what makes an idea interesting? He says, what makes an idea interesting is when it departs from conventional wisdom. If something just affirms your assumptions, you, you don't get curious. You don't get intrigued. There's no surprise. And you're like, boom, confirmation bias. All good. Uh, when you're interested is when you're like, huh, that's, that's the opposite of what I, I would have thought, or that's different from what I would have believed. And 
I don't think specificity gets you there. I think if you, know, if you have a really specific story that confirms everything I always thought was true about the world, I'm not that excited. If you have a specific theory that, uh, <laughs> I read a Malcolm Gladwell book generator once uh, that created fake book titles of yours, and one of them that I remember was <laughs> nothing, what sandcastles can tell us about North Korea. <laughs> Like, that's interesting, right? I'm like, wow, I never would have thought that yeah. a sandcastle could explain North Korea. Yeah. And so don't, don't you think that specificity needs to be coupled with yeah. surprise? Sure. Good. By the way, I don't think I rest that, my case. That guy's Thank theory, you all so much for coming. <laughs> that guy's theory of it, what's interesting, not terribly interesting. I mean, it's the... I mean, yeah, so Davis then creates... This is the worst thing for a social scientist to do, but he creates a typology of the interesting. And he says, there are all these different ways that you can challenge an assumption. But mm -hmm. I think what is interesting is he says, but not all assumptions want to be challenged. And so an interesting idea is one that challenges your weakly held assumptions. Whereas if you challenge somebody's strongly held assumptions, they just say, you're wrong oh, or you're stupid. Oh, that's good. Yo, that's, that's, that's fun. Uh, you've been working on the fit topic uh, around questions of, what does it take to be effective or successful or a high performer? And you know, how much does my environment and whether I fit it matter? Uh, and I'd love to talk about that. So can you tell us first what, what you've been doing there? Well, I, had, I wanted to talk about basketball because right now the NBA is this lovely little case study in fit. To backtrack, basketball, the kind of intuitive position of basketball is it's the sport where talent matters most and coaching and organizational fit matter least. If you put LeBron on a team of all Sarans, you can basically guarantee you'll make the playoffs. And he actually has made the finals several times with teams of all. So it's like, it doesn't really matter who's with LeBron. He's, you know, you can put a bunch of stiffs and it's fine, right? Um, in fact, the two greatest teams, basketball teams of all time, the mid 90s Chicago Bulls, were three superstars and then two very ordinary players. Their fifth player was a big, slow white guy from Australia. And if you look at the Warriors of two years ago, they were three superstars, and then their fifth player was a big, slow, lumbering white guy from Australia. Like, it doesn't <laughs> matter. You could just go to Australia and like, get some random guy, and be, he can be your fifth. <laughs> so, but what's happening now in basketball, there's this couple examples in this season that sort of go against that. One is that one of the best guards in the game this season was this guy named Victor Oladipo on OKC, and was considered a disaster. And he simply moves teams to a new environment mm -hmm. with a, presumably a better coach. He's no longer playing with Russell Westbrook, who's a, probably a very difficult person to play with. And simply by moving teams, he went from being someone who was widely considered to be a bust, someone who'd be washing out of the league soon or a mediocre player, into this suddenly a superstar who's kind of playing transcendently. The reverse is also true that the best coach in the league is probably Brad Stevens of the Boston Celtics. I second that. And every time a very promising player is traded from the Boston Celtics, they turn out to be terrible. Like, they just leave Boston, and they go on another team, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, the guy, actually, Jay Crowder is a good example. Everyone was like, oh, Jay Crowder's really good. Oh, and then Boston trades him, like, oh, God, they traded Jay Crowder. Wow, I don't know if they can survive without Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder goes to the Cleveland Cavaliers, and like, they, all of a sudden, people realize, oh, Jay Crowder's actually not any good. He just was good on Boston. And well, so, and there's, there's another piece of, I think, evidence for your theory, which is this season they've lost their two biggest stars, and the first time they got better, and the second yeah. time they were way better than they should have been. Yeah. So it's like, now, is this always true in basketball? I don't know, but we're certainly, in this moment in basketball, it seems like it's very, very, very coach-dependent. And when you see those, I've given a couple, those, those specific example, anecdotal examples, you then begin to wonder how many players on basketball teams um, who we consider mediocre are actually really good, but just in the wrong environment. Is Victor Oladipo, is he an exception or is he part of a larger trend? And I'm increasingly of the opinion that there must be lots of Victor Oladipos out there. I think there are, and I think they're not just in basketball. So this makes me think of a study of cardiac surgeons where you track their performance over the course of the day. And the question is how many surgeries do they have to perform with let's say minimally invasive robot technology uh, before they, they get to the point where they're up the learning curve. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read in a book once that an average of 10,000 hours could be helpful. Uh, <laughs> that does not turn out to be the case. Uh, practice has no effect whatsoever in that context. And they are as deadly on surgery number 100 and 1,000 as they were on number one. 
And this is weird, right? Because we're supposed to learn from experience. And so what Huckman and Pisano did was they broke down the data by which hospital you're performing surgery at. And they said, well, what, what's the effect of practice at hospital A on your performance at hospital A versus then hospital B? Mm -hmm. And they found that surgeries were hospital specific. So that every surgery I performed at hospital A, at least up to a certain point, reduced the patient mortality rate by about 1%. But then later that afternoon as a surgeon, I would go over to hospital B and it's like I'm starting over. And I have none of that experience. And the reason is I have a different team. Right, um, who, who knows yeah. my strengths and weaknesses, and we've developed a set of effective routines. And that, that kind of suggests that performance and skill and expertise is team-specific. It's context-specific. And then you see the same thing in financial services companies. There's this great Boris Groisberg et al. study where they look at star financial analysts. And the question is, if they get poached by a different firm, what happens to their performance? And on average, it takes them five years to recover their star status, unless they take their team with them in which case they show no dip in performance. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me think the people you surround yourself with really matter. Mm -hmm. Discuss. Well, does this, <laughs> does this suggest that we, what if when we hire people from competing organizations, we always hire the team? In other words, isn't it, isn't it a lot more rational for me if I'm you know, the University of Toronto and I want to poach Adam Grant, why don't I poach you and all of the colleagues who you think make you as good as you are? But why, I mean, in a business context, this would make even more sense. Why isn't it routine for businesses to try and um, it should be. hire the group? So 2012, uh, I was asked to speak at a Google event. Uh, I, I walked in and Larry Page was on stage. How, how do you follow that? And they told me they wanted me to explain how I would run Google as an organizational psychologist. What would I do differently? And this is exactly the point I made to them, is I said, you know, you, if you look at your greatest innovations from, you know, the Google search engine uh, all the way across, you know, a few, a few more recent ones, they've almost all been a dyad or a team. And yet, you hire individuals, you reward individuals, you promote individuals, you fire individuals. What if you did what Groisberg calls a lift out? And you hired entire teams, which you sometimes see in tech and aqua hires. And, but you didn't just do that, you promoted teams. You rewarded teams, and when a team failed, you fired the whole group as opposed to the individual. And they got really excited about it, and then they did the math of like, how much work it was going to be to keep a team together. And they said, this is just not practical. And so instead, they said, we're going to study what makes our teams great and then try to create more of those conditions so that anyone can join any team and become great. But I'm, I'm a big fan of this. Wait, does, that, does what they wanted to do make any sense? Or does that sound like a cop, like Silicon Valley cop-out? No, I think it makes a lot of sense. So they, they, what they realized was they have some teams that are high performing maybe despite that shared experience. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to figure out what were the conditions that accelerated you up that curve. And so you know, they found, I'm sure you've, you've seen the but research. Wait. Having observed that teams outperform individuals, they said that they would, rather than use teams, just study the individuals in the no, team. No, no, no. So they wanted to study the qualities of great teams yeah. and how to enable any team, even if they hadn't shown excellence together, to reach that level of success. Uh, Which I thought was reasonable. Okay. I'm still, it seems insanely convoluted in the way that those guys... I mean, it's not enough to take a very simple idea that a team that is observed to work well should be kept together and continue to work well. They instead want to kind of abstract out the quality yeah. and recreate it over there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think they're... <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I definitely see what you're saying. There's a certain people get so smart that... <laughs> the obvious thing is no longer satisfactory. They're like, no, 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 Adam, I can think of a way that's way harder and way more complicated and ultimately might work as well. I think we should do that way. Definitely. No, look, I think there, there are two complications. One is to push it to a further extreme. Uh, over 75% over of, of airline accidents happen the first time a crew is flying together. Yeah. And the evidence goes so far on this that uh, NASA did, did a simulation showing that if you had a crew that was well-rested flying together for the first time, they made more errors than a sleep-deprived crew that had just pulled an all-nighter but had flown together before. And you talk to airlines about this, and you say you should force right, pilots to, to work together. They're like, we, we, logistically, we can't do it. Like, there's no way to organize these flight mapping schedules so that everybody is always together. And that, you know, I think Google has a version of that challenge, right? Yeah. as do most companies. The other challenge, which, which I think in some ways is bigger, is that uh, like everything else in life, this is curvilinear, and there's such a thing as too much shared experience. So in the NBA, teams max out on, on probability of success around three or four years together, 
And then once they have more than four years of shared experience, their odds of winning go down. And maybe they're just getting old, the players, by that point. But a lot of it seems to be routine rigidity. And that you become more predictable, you, you stop innovating, you stop, stop adapting, and other teams can, can develop ways to defeat you. And so you know, I'd worry a lot about saying, hey, we've got a really successful team. Let's just go let them you know, be great until they, they suck. Yeah. I do think, though, that there, there's some interesting questions this raises. So if we go back to the idea of fit, and we say, all right, so you know, we, we know that people perform better with a team they understand well or a team that they, they fit into. The natural extension of that is to say, OK, when I go into a company, I've, or any workplace, I've got to assess their culture. I've got to figure out what the people are like. It might be values, personalities, skill sets. And I want to go join a place where I belong. And I guess two questions for you. The first one is, how do you recommend doing that? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, what do you think are the, the problems associated with it? Well, so it's funny, because I have an episode of my podcast this season where I deal with this question quite explicitly. And it's all about a very brilliant military guy who goes into, at a crucial moment in this country's history, goes into government service and works for, I say, non-military government service. What's one of the weird things about military guys is that when they refer to the government, they don't refer to the military, like as if the military is not the government, which I always find quite charming. Um, but, so he goes into a standard Washington bureaucracy as a Marine Corps guy. And what happens is mayhem, in a certain sense. He's too good for the job. They've never had someone. So one thing he does, I don't want to give too much away, but one of the things he does is he realizes his predecessor had never left Washington. And this is an agency that has far-flung operations all over the world. And he's like, that's crazy. And he then visits absolutely every one of the 400 field offices of his organization in three years. At the same time as he gives 250 speeches, testifies before Congress, writes hundreds of articles, just because he's a Marine Corps guy, and that's what they do. They're like, they're in a hurry, they're really super organized, they're busy, and they don't do a job unless they're gonna do it well, right? That is not the way what bureaucracies work, you know, and for good reason. <laughs> You don't want bureaucracies run by Marine Corps guys. The worst thing that can happen if, it's a, if you're in a bureaucracy is that the bureaucracy gets really, really good, right? That is the end of freedom as we know it. The thing that saves it, and I don't mean this, I'm, I'm not being funny, I'm being dead serious. We are, our liberties are imperiled by overly competent bureaucrats, right? So. This guy who's like super, super competent is it's just a tragic misfit in a standard Washington bureaucracy. Now, why doesn't he adapt? Well, he could adapt, I think, if he'd left as a 35-year-old Marine Corps colonel. But he leaves at 62, and having, he was the commandant of the Marine Corps, so his Marine Corps-iness was ingrained <laughs> in his but I'd, at that point in his career, it's more problematic than it would have been earlier. I think government service is a really good example of this because um, the culture of government service is so specific and in some ways so counterintuitive that you know, we persist, for example, in this country in thinking that business success is a useful predictor of, of political success. And it's not. Couldn't be more different, right? The kind of skills you need to navigate the political process are not the ones you learn running a company. I think where, you know, where this gets tricky for me is, if we go back to your, your Marine guy, I would say there's a, a study that Chad Hartnell led that was published recently, which showed that the more you misfit, the more you contribute. And so if you were to read an organizational culture, uh, we could distinguish them on, on task versus relational values. Right? So task-oriented organizations are high efficiency, high productivity. They're all about getting stuff done. Relational organizations are much more community oriented, they're all about family, and they're independent. You could be high on both, but oftentimes organizations that maximize on one don't the other. And what Chad found is that if you bring a leader into the C-suite, if the organization's culture is more task focused, the relational leader actually adds more value mm -hmm. uh, because they're not redundant. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I would say the Marine guy is exactly, right? the commandant is exactly who you want to put into government because he's providing something that is sorely lacking. Yeah, except in this, I should have added, in this specific instance, uh, the policy that he was enacting, that he was so brilliantly enacting, was a terrible policy. Yeah. In other words, it works really well when you know what you're, when you give, you know, that right. task-oriented person orders that make sense. Right. In this case, we gave him orders that made no sense. Got it. 
And so I guess you know, there's a paradox here, though, which is you know, we're, we're all happier and more comfortable in organizations that fit our values. And yet sometimes it's the ones that, that diverge or clash where we can contribute the most or differentiate ourselves the most. How do you think about resolving that paradox? And you're, you're writing a book about uh, how we gauge strangers. Mm -hmm. How do you think about sizing up a new organization, a new culture, a new workplace, a new boss? I think that we undersample uh, new situations. Uh, we make up our minds far too quickly, and we're pressured to make up a better way of saying it. We're pressured to make up our minds far too quickly. I don't know why we would logically expect that someone ought to be able to size up a new organization in over the course of a bunch of lunches with managers there who are interviewing you. Um, that seems silly to me. Um, I'm, you know, I, uh, I happen to be a big um, car nut. I look at the cars. And one thing I have found is that you can't size up a car on a test drive. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. So you're about to spend an enormous sum of money on a car. And the, you go for the test drive. And the test drive is basically they go around the block with you. It's nonsense, right? It's almost as if they're, they're afraid of you actually driving the car before purchasing it, which is a very odd position for an automobile salesman to take, that they are, you know, <laughs> they are anxious about you having too much experience with their product before you buy it. Um, so there's a, you know, we don't, and they don't seem to think this is a problem. They seem to think that if you just sit in the car, you can somehow intuit, you know, all that's good and bad about that automobile just by, I really enjoy how much this bothers you. Oh, it drives me. It's a car, right? If this, if this were, like, you can only go on three dates with someone before you're allowed to decide whether you want to marry them. I get getting upset. But this is a car. Who cares? What do you drive? <laughs> you're driving like... I'm not entirely sure. Like like a you're like a Hyundai. You got like a Hyundai from... I've never driven a Hyundai, but a car is solely function. It gets me from one place to another. Well, to my point, yeah. I don't care how it drives, <laughs> yeah. Do you really not know? What, tell, come on, tell us. What are you driving? <laughs> uh, I actually am not entirely sure what it is. My wife picked it out. <laughs> My wife loves cars. She picked it out, yeah. and I drive it occasionally. Interesting. All right. <laughs> That's Malcolm Gladwell and me talking at the 92nd Street Y this past April. We'll get back to that conversation in a minute. I love talking about work, thinking about work, and imagining what the future of work will be like. One of my favorite places to do that is at the TED conference in Vancouver. All right, welcome everyone. Woo! This year, I invited a group of 50 leaders and entrepreneurs to join me for a workshop. We talked about the challenges we're anticipating in the future of work and how individuals in workplaces might tackle them. Our main topic, artificial intelligence. This is very often a doom and gloom story. Even just the, the, the branding itself, right? How many artificial things are you excited about in your life? <laughs> right? Artificial normally means fake or bad. And so even if, if an AI could create a Mona Lisa, would you want to buy it? I asked our sponsors to kick off the discussion by sharing their insights. Accenture and Bonobos highlighted how the combo of human intelligence and artificial intelligence makes us smarter. When you combine human and machines, it gives people superpowers. And artificial intelligence, really, we see its job as being able to empower people. AI can help us make more informed decisions by giving us better data, can take some of the routine work away and allow our team to focus on the sort of creative layer. Warby Parker and J.P. Morgan Chase emphasized how artificial intelligence can accelerate decision making and enable a more personalized service. Machine learning and AI will be able to diagnose patients faster and more consistently uh, than, than humans alone and predict outcomes uh, much better than, than humans alone. And that'll just allow doctors to spend more time with patients. We bring AI to human processes to try and make better decisions, make faster decisions, and make much more personalized recommendations to all of our clients. Then we divided the room into teams to brainstorm about how to highlight some of the neglected benefits of AI. Each team was assigned a fake company profile, ranging from household consumer goods to magazine publishing to financial services. Their challenge? Create a 60-second pitch to convince their employee base that AI could actually be useful to them. So maybe packaging is something that would be easily automated. What is the current temperature conversation vocabulary inside the company about this subject? The people are now the premium on what the AI does for the, the end product, I'm the outcome. About, 
One idea was to relabel AI as something a little less scary. Rebrand it as adorable intelligence. <laughs> and then there was the idea of considering AI to be like a coworker, a super coworker named Sally. Sally comes to us from a little bit of a different background. She's actually a machine. And Sally, she now knows everything that customers want which frees up her colleagues to have more human interactions. Joe can now spend time with every client. Though we didn't solve all the problems, there was at least one attendee who gained new insights. I'm reaching uh, nirvana, uh, basically. Uh, uh, organizational psychology nirvana. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who took part in our meeting, especially my workshop co-organizers Lisa Choi Owens and Erica Flynn from TED. And special thanks to our sponsors who helped make this possible. Warby Parker, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bonobos, and Accenture. Now let's get back to my conversation with Malcolm Gladwell. A couple other things I want to ask you about. Uh, if, if you were the CEO of a large company, what are the first policies you would either kill or create that would change the way that work life is experienced in your organization? Oh, that's super interesting. Well, I'd like, I mean, I'm very, in my way back in Tipping Point, I wrote about the, this whole idea of keeping groups under 150. And I thought about that since, and I do think that I would try and keep sections of the company small and independent, under 150 if possible. I just think people enjoy themselves much more when, when they know everyone that they're working with, and when there is that extra element, when there is that social bond, in addition to kind of formal things, keeping people together, that's just much more powerful. I would take a people's uh, physical health far more seriously. Um, I think that if you, that whole, I mean, it sounds very Scandinavian and. <laughs> Why did you say that pejoratively? Well, because if you're Canadian and you grew up in the 70s and in, in the 80s in Canada, one of the, the principal advertisers in Canada is the Canadian government. And, which is unusual, because it doesn't happen here, but, and what the Canadian government used to do, well, far more actually in that period, is that they would buy all this time on the radio and TV to make certain arguments about how we could be better Canadians. And invariably the arguments about being better Canadians involved holding up Scandinavians as a role model. So they would always tell us that, well, the Swedes live, you know, four years longer than the average Canadian. And, or the Swedes, you know, the Norwegians are running 20 miles a week, whereas the average Canadian runs barely at all. I mean, they're always like, so as a kid, constantly like walking around with this kind of vague anxiety that I was not living up to the Scandinavian <laughs> model. Secretly, those ads were funded by the Scandinavian <laughs> government. Right. But, but, I, always, yeah. but I mean, with the passage of time, I've come uh, to look more fondly on that. Um, and I still think they have a lot of things right. Um, you know, like if you go to Amsterdam and everyone's cycling to work, and you just think, how fantastic is this? And the thing is, it works because everyone's doing it. The thing, all of our problems with cycling to work have to do with the fact that we don't want to be the only person on the road cycling, right? But once everyone's cycling, it's fine. So, if, and that's sort of what they've understood in Amsterdam. Like my, I, went, I once had dinner with my Dutch publisher who was a woman in her 60s, and it was, it, we, it was March, and at the end of dinner, she disappeared into the bathroom and emerged in a, wetsuit. I was, like, I was like, like, where are you going? And she was like, well, I'm cycling home now. And she... Underwater? She, no, I mean, when I say a wetsuit, I mean like a, you know, like a full-on kind of oh, zip it. up. And she, uh, she got on a bicycle and she, she rode eight miles through the rain home. And she did that every day. I just thought that was so fantastic. Oh. Anyway, if were I CEO, I would like to somehow... I just think people are much happier when they get a chance to regularly exercise. And sadly, that doesn't most people's schedules don't allow for that. So as an avid runner, what does that look like? Does your company have exercise breaks built into the day? My company's clearly not going to make a lot of money <laughs> since <laughs> we're going to be working out a lot. But You'll be really fast, <laughs> though, and really but healthy. My, yeah. You know, my, far be it for me to hold up Joyce Glabel as an example of, that's my mother, as an example of uh, work life, because my mother had a very unique perspective on work, which was it never occurred to her that the point of work was to make money. She had a whole list of things that came first. But um, one of Joyce Glaubo's great observations was that whenever she got a job, as she had in, in the second half of her career, she, the first thing she would do is she would go to her boss and she would say, look, I know I could work full time, but it's pointless. I can get, if you let me work 
you know, half time, I can get just as much work done and I'm going to be happier and you're going to be happier. And they would always agree after she pointed out that this was, and I think she's kind of right that much of what people do can be accomplished if they are happy and well rested and can be accomplished in some fraction of the time they currently spend on the job. So I'm not sure whether my company loses money. I think a reasonably productive place. My father, a mathematician, once was offered a job at Yale. And so he left for the weekend uh, to go in to, for the week to visit Yale, spent a week there. Came back, we were all on pins and needles. We'll be moving to New Haven. And he, he said, so what, you know, he said, what, you, was it, what was it like? He was like, no, it's not happening. I said, we're like, why? You didn't like Yale? Yale, famous place. He goes, I got in there at nine o'clock. They were all at their desks. I left at five. They were still at their desks. <laughs> <laughs> This is not going to work. Not work. Uh, when you came out with David and Goliath, uh, I, I remember talking and, and you know, I, was, I was thinking that you're, you wrote this book about underdogs because you love to root for the underdog. And you said no. And to this day, I'm surprised and puzzled about why, and I'm hoping I can get to the bottom of it. Mm. Why do you root for the favorite? I believe that's the only truly empathetic position to take. Um, and that you're right, I feel a lot of empathy for the New York Yankees. Rooting for the underdog is a, is a form of moral weakness, and I'll explain why. <laughs> um, so you have two people are competing. One person is expected to win. One person is not expected to win, right? If the person who is not expected to win doesn't win, they're mildly disappointed, but not massively disappointed because they didn't expect to win. If the person who is expected to win doesn't win, they are massively disappointed because the gap between their expectation and reality is enormous. They're suffering. They go home devastated. Their lives are over. They want to give up everything. They go through a massive soul searching. They wander off into the desert without water or food. Their lives are living hell. If you are a truly empathetic person, where does your sympathy lie? With the person who's like, well, I didn't, I didn't win, but you know, I wasn't gonna win anyway, so what's the point? <laughs> or is your sympathy with the person who is wandering helplessly through the desert <laughs> without benefit of food and water because they lost something that they had every expectation they would win? Where's your heart, Adam? <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm gonna go with the underdog. No, this Malcolm, is so that, that is so callous. sick and twisted. Sick so and twisted. Callous. You're, I, you're, there, there's so much wrong with your reasoning there, I don't know where to start. So, first of all, I, I will grant you the point. Tim Urban's here in the audience, and he has this great equation that says happiness is reality minus expectations. And that's true. And so, I think you're, you're absolutely right that the favorite is going to be more disappointed if they lose mm -hmm. than if the underdog loses. But what you're not accounting for is all the joy the favorite had the last five times the Patriots won the Super Bowl. So, I don't have a lot of empathy for Tom Brady. He still has his five rings, he still has his chin, He's going to be fine. Whereas the, the Eagles, you know, suffering through many, many years of oh, almost that's being what this great. Is about. No, it's not about this the Eagles. This is just about the Eagles. It's a recent and salient it example. It all comes back to as a native Phil. Well, yeah. Anyway, but <laughs> think about think about the fact that, that Tom Brady has a whole bank of joy built up over decades, and poor Nick Foles has been struggling his whole career, and he gets to catch a touchdown pass in the Super Bowl. You can't reconfigure the kind of principles of human psychology in service of your own Philadelphia inferiority complex. <laughs> That's essentially what's happening here. You are on home turf, this is not fair. Uh, but no, I, I could play this story out for any group, right? The, the teams that have won, the individuals that have already been on top, they have already enjoyed the fruits of, of experiencing that. Here's, here's the problem with this. Don't you, wait a minute, hold on. You claim what? to believe in social justice. Yeah. You do. And so you basically want to maintain inequality and just let the winners keep winning. No. And yet, you wrote a whole book about how you want to create opportunities for David to become Goliath. Yeah. So you should be rooting for David. No. The book was an abstract exercise in understanding <laughs> uh, how a socially maladaptive outcome, the underdog winning, couldn't be understood. That's all. Let me give you another... That is not how let I read me, it. Just let me, last thing. Let me just explain to you how I first came to this understanding. What you are overstating is the degree of joy that accompanies an underdog's victory. The reason you're overstating it is you're forgetting the circumstances under which underdogs win. So I first 
and most clearly formulated this principle of rooting for the favorite during the 1976 Montreal Olympics, when Greg Joy, who was the overwhelming favorite to win the, long, the high jump, lost to a Polish guy, Vladek something, uh, <laughs> who was nothing, who was like not even a good, why? <laughs> because it rained that day. And Greg Joy depended, was a very technique driven high jumper who needed absolute precision in his, um, when he planted his foot before he jumped. It was rainy and wet, his foot, he was slipping and sliding. He lost and like Vladek won, right? <laughs> now Vladek for the rest of his life would look at his gold medal and say, well, you know, I only really won this because it was raining. Wait, and no, hold on, no one ever thinks that way. <laughs> oh yeah, no, yeah. No, no, no. oh yeah, it was a tainted no, victory. Hold on, tainted you, victory. Yeah, Vladek, yeah, even today, it. even today he looks at, he's got his, he's probably doesn't no. even have it in, his, in, a, in a case on his wall. He's probably got it in a tucked away because he's slightly <laughs> ashamed of it and his, his daughter, <laughs> says to him, Dad, how did you do in the 76 Olympics? And he says, I don't want to talk about it because it's a little. You, I, I cannot let you get away with that. You have claimed that, that Ross and Nisbet gave you your worldview with the person in the situation, a book that they wrote based on their research on attribution theory, which showed very clearly and has shown for decades that human beings naturally attribute failures to external forces and successes to internal forces. So Vladek is going around thinking, I am the world's greatest high jumper. And not only that, I was able to be great on a day where it rained, when I was at a serious disadvantage. So eat that, Greg Joy. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, change your mind, I can tell. It's fine. Go back to But are you going to change yours? No. Are you, I, this, you don't position. want the underdog to have a chance to just experience for a moment the joy of being on top. It's tainted. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take some listener and audience questions. Uh, this is from Kelly. She wants to know how often you assess your career goals and how your goals have changed over time. I don't know if I have career goals. Just to be left alone and basically. <laughs> I can't let that one go. You've made these, these shifts and turns, right? So you started a podcast. Uh, you were writing a TV pilot at one point. Um, you, you must be trying to accomplish something in terms of your influence and the way that you spread ideas. Is, there's not a goal there? Well, I don't want to get bored, <laughs> I think. I mean, it's serious. I don't, I don't know if there's anything more than that that uh, I'd like to try. The podcast was I wanted to try something new. The screenplay was I wanted to try something new. The writing books was I wanted to try something new. I left the Washington Post to do magazine writing because I wanted to try something new. I mean, I wasn't unhappy in any of those places, but I just thought, uh, in fact, I love, the most fun I ever had in a job was, well, not most fun, was at the Washington Post. Hugely fun, but at a certain point, you, just, you realize, well, there's more to life than just this, right? So you should try something else. All right, Sean wants to know, uh, I recently started a new job, and I'm curious when it's appropriate to begin disagreeing or expressing a different opinion. How would I know? I haven't had a job in years. Uh, <laughs> I, the one time when I had a job at the Washington Post, I felt that the best way to be at work was deeply passive aggressive. That is, <laughs> that you should never express <coughs> your disagreement in a straightforward way. You should rather quietly um, and in a kind of behind the back sort of way make your feelings known. So one of the things that I felt. You are such a disappointment. To, to you know, adults. This was, this was the most important thing I did at Washington Post was I realized very early on that the way to make sure that you were given assignments that you liked was to never do a good job with assignments that you didn't like. <laughs> and this rule, Yeah, this is called strategic sloppiness. This yeah. is so routinely violated by people. So at the Washington Post, we had an editor who was obsessed with weather stories. If there was a Hurricane, he wanted to send 20 people there. And nothing is less fun than covering a hurricane. <laughs> and so the hurricanes would come and we would be sent out en masse. And I could see, I was no dummy. I could see what a trap this was because there's like two or three major hurricanes a year. They last, you know, I mean, some of them can be, you can spend two weeks in like some, some storm ravaged town in South Florida. Like this is just not, no part of this sounds interesting to me. <laughs> so I was assigned, there was a hurricane that was hitting the Outer Banks uh, and it was centering on a town on Columbia, North Carolina. Where did I go? Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> and I called in and I said, sun's shining here. I don't know what you guys are <laughs> talking about. 
<laughs> and then when they got angry, I was able to use my trump card, which was, I'm Canadian. I didn't know there was two <laughs> Colombians. Who did, what? Wow. Who thought it was a good idea to have, by the way, think about this. Who thought it was a good idea to have a Columbia in North Carolina and a Columbia in South Carolina? <laughs> is, is there such a shortage of names of cities <laughs> that before they separate the two Carolinas, they're squabbling over who gets to use Columbia. Like, there's a short list, and like, Columbia's on the list, and like, the whole thing's ridiculous. And yet, when I wanted to not be handed, you know, tasks that I thought were, were not a good use of time, like sitting yeah. on a, a committee to determine furniture purchases, I just let it fall to the bottom of my priority list and didn't do a good job at it. You traveled to a different city in a different state I know, I know, I know. to but, get out of doing the job that you didn't so want genius. to do. The, the thing is, you had to make a statement. So it's not <laughs> enough to be kind of... If, you, if I was just kind of routinely incompetent, fine, they could deal with that. They have routinely incompetent people on staff. They would just throw me back into the fire the next time there was a hurricane. So this is I extreme need to be, incompetence. I need to be spectacularly, like, <laughs> they need to think, Glabble doesn't even know where North Carolina is. We can't send him <laughs> out to do hurricane coverage. So it was like, it, that was, I thought a lot about that one before I pulled that particular stunt. I feel so proud to know you right now. Uh, different question, this is from Brad. If blue collar jobs are replaced by AI, how do you stay relevant as a worker? I wonder whether, are blue collar jobs the ones that are gonna get replaced by AI or are white collar jobs the ones that are gonna get replaced by AI? That would be my first question. Go on. Um, I, Cause I, I keep hearing really interesting uh, predictions that focus more on the displacement of uh, cognitively complex. So if you think about, like there was a great article in the New York Times about by someone saying, you know, Autonomous vehicles don't put truck drivers out of work because truck drivers do a lot more than drive trucks. Mm -hmm. They do a whole bunch of personal tasks that require a person that a machine can't do. So the actual driving part is just some small, so what you might have is a situation where you have a human in the truck, only the human's not driving all the time, mm -hmm. but you still need the human. Check on the cargo, manage the, make sure the truck is working properly, you know, meet with the person when they're picking, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if, you know, a lawyer is doing document search, you know, that seems to me really straightforward for AI. Um, you're just trying to eliminate lawyers? No, 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 not at all. But I mean, I would be, I know that lawyers are quite worried about it, and I think appropriately. Um, so how does one stay relevant? I mean, I think the answer is that you just need to be Go to, the obvious answer is go to the things the machine is not. I'm not an alarmist about AI. I happen to think that there are so many things that we need people to do that are not being done right now, that most of that involve communicating with them and empathizing with them and mm -hmm. helping them out, that some displacement of, in some areas is not, gonna, is not the end of the world. It just means that we'll be able to focus a lot more on people who are in need of help. Uh, Stuart and Dave both submitted basically the same question, which is, uh, you wrote about Enron a long time ago. Uh, what lessons did corporate America fail to learn from that debacle that we're still in need of learning? Well, there's so much fun about the Enron case. Um, fun thing I'm sorry, you said fun? <clears throat> yes. Fun thing number one, is, which is the thing that I wrote about at the time. Well, I wrote two Enron articles. The second one was better than the first. In the second one, I pointed out that Enron was an example of a scandal in which Everything that was used to bring down Enron was uh, material in the public record put out by Enron. In other words, to know what Enron was doing wrong, all you had to do was to read the material that Enron had given to the public on what Enron was doing. And the reason it took so long to bring Enron down is that basically no one ever read the stuff they were putting out. Now, this raises a really interesting question. If everything that was used to end Enron was based on stuff that Enron told us, then what did Enron do wrong? So basically, if you think that Enron was a fraud and you say, I know they're a fraud because here in their 10Ks, they detail all the crazy things they're doing, but they told you they were doing crazy things. So what's your case? Why were you buying the Enron stock if Enron told you they were doing crazy things? Maybe you didn't read the 10K, which you're supposed to do if you buy a lot of Enron stock. So it gets very confusing. It's not the same, in other words, as the woman at Theranos, what's her name? Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes. So there's now a case against Elizabeth Holmes. That's very different. So she was pretending to do X, and in fact doing, we think, doing Y. That's fraud. 
But if I tell you I'm doing Y and then I do Y, and you say, wait a minute, you did Y, you should go to jail. That's confusing. So as long as I tell you, <laughs> so if I tell you I'm gonna defraud you, you're okay with it? Well, no, I don't, I'm not saying I'm okay with it. I'm saying it's a different kind of crime. And it's one that I don't really understand anymore. I'm used to the model that the con man is trying to con me. Right. I'm not used to the model where the con man says before he cons me, here's how I'm gonna con you, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, Doug wants to know what actions you recommend young professionals take to shape an organization, even though they might not be in charge yet. And I, I feel like we need to disclaim that we, we don't necessarily want to follow your career advice. But, but what, what, what advice would you give on that? You want to change an organization? Uh, a culture you don't like, a yeah. policy you think is broken? Not be passive aggressive, I'm guessing. It's um, <laughs> a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I, um, when I think back at my time in a large organization, Washington Post, the thing that was most frustrating to me was the uh, extent to which people over time in an organization put the uh, needs and desires of those on the inside ahead of the needs and desires of those who they're serving. So there was a famous case of a very, a very, very brilliant reporter who was fired from the Washington Post because he was difficult to work with. But there was very little understanding of the fact that what made him a brilliant reporter was the same thing that made him d difficult oh, to work with. Yeah. And that you, if you fired everyone who was difficult to work with at the Washington Post, you wouldn't have a newspaper anymore. You would, you know, you would. <laughs> and I thought it was odd that, a, that an editor didn't consider it as part of their job description, the ability to work with difficult people, mm -hmm. right? That's why you do that job. And that's what makes you good is that, at that job. And then there's a, a point at which sometimes people get um, so kind of um, immersed in their environment that the, the reader who you're supposed to be serving falls away and you just think about what would make your life better. So I guess in answer to that question, one simple way is to keep, remi keep reminding yourself and those around you what the point of your organization is, who you're serving. But go back to the, the sampling. So how long do you want with someone and how are you vetting them and vice versa? How long? Because you hire take? people. Well, I you, hire assistants. Yeah, I've had, you have assistants who work for you. Uh, I've been very lucky with them. Only there's only one I ever got rid of because it didn't work out. What what happened was it very rapidly became clear to me that she was a bad assistant, but it also at the same time became clear to me that she was um, a wonderful person and so deeply hilarious that she couldn't even send an email that wasn't an absolutely brilliant piece of work that would reduce you to you know, helpless scales of laughter. And so that really changed my perspective on hiring. Because I was like, would I, was I willing to give up competence in her job for the delight of reading her <laughs> emails? And the answer is absolutely. So I was like, you know, as long as they have bringing something interesting to the table, I'm happy. I do, I do feel like the record needs to show that you just said she was brilliant because she was hilarious. So I stand by my comedian point from earlier. She was in a... <laughs> Uh, this has been incredibly fun. Thank you for agreeing to join us, uh, for sharing uh, your bad advice, uh, and, and your interesting ideas, and your wisdom, and your arguments that have inspired so many of us to ask more interesting, deeper, bigger questions. Uh, it's a real honor. I want to thank you, Malcolm, and thank all of you for being here. Work Life is hosted by me, Adam Grant. The show is produced by Ted with Transmitter Media and Pineapple Street Media. Our team includes Colin Helms, Greta Cohn, Gabrielle Lewis, Dan O'Donnell, Angela Cheng, and Janet Lee. This bonus episode was produced by Anne Hepperman and Max Linsky. Special thanks to the 92nd Street Y for hosting our discussion, and to Malcolm Gladwell for the always delightful conversational sparring. Don't forget to check out the latest season of his podcast, Revisionist History. And thanks to you for listening. If you liked what you heard, rate and review the show. It helps people find us. That's a wrap for season one. Stay tuned for season two.